Does your tummy hurt? Are you always tired and feeling bloated? Do you think food sensitivities might be the culprit? Everly Well tests your blood to identify food sensitivities. Is that a thing? Sounds like Gwyneth Paltrow. Oh, it does sound a little goopy to me. Let's science it. <laughs> Hey, welcome to Nourishable, I'm Dr. Lara. Everly Well sells an at-home blood test that claims to help you identify your personal food sensitivities. They do this by measuring a specific type of antibody in your blood, called immunoglobulin G, or IgG. Their website claims that having IgG reactive to food proteins indicates that you may have a sensitivity to that food. They measure IgG to 96 foods, including different kinds of seafood, dairy, eggs, meat, legumes, spices, grains, fruits, veggies, nuts, and seeds. I was being bombarded by Everly Well ads and a bunch of people were asking me what I thought of it. So I decided to dig into the research and try it out myself. Okay, so I'm going to let my blood card dry for 30 minutes, then I'm going to package it up and send it off in the mail. Um, we'll see when I get my results. I'll let you know. A few words on antibodies. Antibodies are proteins produced by white blood cells that help alert the immune system to invaders, like bacteria. They're shaped like a Y, with hands that bind specifically to invading proteins. Antibodies come in a bunch of different flavors. Immunoglobulin E, or IgE, is a type of antibody in food allergies. I have a peanut allergy, so I have IgE with peanut-shaped hands. The Everly Well test doesn't measure IgE, so it can't diagnose food allergies, and their website clearly states this. The IgG antibodies measured by the Everly Well test are totally normal to have in your blood. Everyone does. Research shows us that food IgGs indicate that A, we're exposed to that food, and B, we're tolerant of that food. These food-specific IgGs are the immune system's way of saying, hey, I see you, you're not a human, but you're cool, you can be here. Keep that in mind as we review my results. Hey, so my Everly Well results came in, so let's walk through them together. Your test showed an IgG reactivity above normal to 30 foods. Hmm. So I had one high reactivity food. So egg white, that's interesting, because I eat eggs almost every day. I usually eat about one egg a day. Um, I've never noticed any issues with that at all, but this is my one high reactivity food according to the IgG. Huh, okay, so now let's look at my moderate reactivity foods. Seven foods. Cow's milk, egg yolk, gluten, peanut, rye, wheat, and yogurt. Huh, so it's really interesting to have peanut in here because I know that I have an anaphylactic allergy to peanuts. Um, that's a, Now that's an IgE allergy, so it's a different kind of antibody than what we're looking. Um, but let's look at cow's milk first. So I had a 67 for cow's milk. I'm not quite sure what the units are here. Okay, I don't believe I have any sensitivity to cow's milk. I, I do consume dairy pretty frequently. Egg yolk. Huh, so this is interesting that I had high reactivity to egg whites and then moderate reactivity to egg yolk. Um, gluten. Moderate reactivity, 74 provider. So I'm glad that they say that because I think that it could be really confusing if you have celiac disease undiagnosed and then you do this test. It just, it could lead you down the wrong path. Um, so I apparently am sensitive to gluten according to this. Okay. Rye. So I had moderate reactivity to rye. Um, rye is also actually something I consume pretty regularly. I really like rye bread. I think it has a nice flavor to it. Um, never noticed any sensitivity to rye. Okay. Wheat. Ooh, I had a 93 to read, moderate reactivity. So according to this test, I have food sensitivity to both wheat and to the specific protein gluten that is contained in wheat. I eat wheat, whole, uh, whole grain wheat, barley, I eat all those things pretty much every day. Um, usually I have some kind of delicious whole grain all over my salad. I frequently eat whole grain toast. So that's kind of interesting that I'm getting at this high food sensitivity result to wheat. I've never noticed any any issues tolerating wheat at all. 85 moderate reactivity result to yogurt. Um, 
I do also consume yogurt almost daily, whether yogurt or kefir, those are two um, fermented dairy products that I do consume almost daily. Okay, so now let's go down to mild reactivity foods. Okay, so we see almond, asparagus, barley grain, bell pop pepper, black walnut, bran, brewer's yeast, carrot, cashew, chicken, clam, eggplant, I love eggplant, garlic, I eat garlic all the time. Sometimes more than my husband wishes I did. Um, ginger, ooh, I love ginger. Uh, lamb, mozzarella, mustard seed, oats, orange, soybean, white mushroom, white potato. Um, so the only thing on that list that I don't eat regularly is soybean, and that's because I have a uh, an allergy to soybeans from. Let's see what it says about soybean. So this is interesting because, so with my soy protein allergy, I avoid things that have soy protein in them, um, but I have always tolerated soy lecithin fine, and soy lecithin is actually a type of lipid. It's a phospholipid, um, and it's used a lot as an emulsifier, so it's in all sorts of processed food. Um, I've also always been fine with soy oil, which is the, the lipid, the fat portion. So it's, it's interesting to me, that a food sensitivity test would tell you to avoid the other forms of soy that don't have the protein in them. Okay, my test results were normal for the rest of the foods in the test here. So I'm, what I'm curious about actually is how they how they determined the threshold for a normal range. Like when they look at normal, is that do they mean like they tested people who had these levels of IgG in their blood and saw that they have no food sensitivity issues to these foods or like where where does normal come from is really what I'm curious about here skeptical the gears are turning in my head so within these normal level foods there's a, a lot of them I eat a lot of them I eat all the time but it, the normal foods also contain things that I do not ever eat because I'm allergic to them like the green pea and the lima bean and the green beans that's interesting okay so now let's see what Everly Well thinks I should do next. Consider planning an elimination diet. So if I were to do this, I don't think I'm going to because I don't notice any sensitivity to any of the foods that were categorized this, this way. But high, moderate, mild, I'd have to eliminate so many things. One plus seven plus 22, so that's 30 foods? Oh my goodness, I would have to, yeah, that'd be, Huge. So that was interesting. Um, I am, get, you know, I did get high reactivity and moderate reactivity to a bunch of foods that I eat all the time and I tolerate really well. Um, so I'm, I'm still skeptical. That's that's kind of where I am. So I'm gonna return to the research. Um, look at the. Uh, there are a few randomized, double-blind, controlled trials um, that I'm gonna look at to see see whether using an IgG directed elimination diet is effective for controlling any symptoms um, and I will report back to you. I read all the studies about IgG and food sensitivity that I could get my hands on. Check out my references in my video description. There were a bunch of studies that measured IgG in healthy controls compared to people with some kind of condition, like migraine headaches, allergic symptoms, and inflammatory bowel disease. All of these studies show that everyone had food-specific IgG in their blood, though people with conditions like migraines and IBD had higher levels and they had IgG specific to more types of food. That's interesting, but it doesn't actually tie IgG to food sensitivity or to symptoms of these conditions. So far, there's no justification to measure IgG to determine food sensitivity. There was a tiny number of super small, double-blind, randomized controlled studies, the gold standard in research. These studies had a group of subjects with, say, migraine headaches. They tested their blood for food-specific IgG, then designed an elimination diet that eliminated those foods. They also designed a fake elimination diet that eliminated the same number of foods, but not the ones that were identified by the IgG test. The subjects didn't know if they were given the real or fake elimination diet. They would eat their diets for a few weeks to months while keeping track of their symptoms, like how many headaches they had or how severe their pain was. Some of these studies show that the true elimination diet reduced symptoms, though didn't eliminate them altogether, while other studies showed no improvement at all. 
When you put them all together, it's pretty wimpy evidence. I wouldn't go basing my diet on such shaky grounds. But don't just take it from me. Other professional organizations like the European Academy of Allergy and Clinical Immunology state that testing IgG to foods is irrelevant for intolerances and shouldn't be used to diagnose food-related complaints. The view from immunologists is that having food-specific IgG indicates that you tolerate that food well, the complete opposite of the Everly Well interpretation. So we can conclude that IgG tests are not a useful diagnostic tool for food sensitivities. But is there any harm in just trying it anyways? I think so, and here's my nourishable opinion why. First off, if you have a really serious condition, like food allergies or celiac disease, doing this test could delay you getting the diagnosis and treatment that you need. Second, your test results could drive you to eat a really restrictive elimination diet, which is a lot of work and really time consuming. If I eliminated all 30 of my reactive foods, that would be a major overhaul. And third, this is an important one, your test results could drive you to have an unnecessary fear of food for the rest of your life. So let's say you do the test, you eliminate all of your reactive foods, and then you try and keep track of your symptoms while you add foods back in. So many of the possible food sensitivity symptoms, like bloating and fatigue, are super subjective and can be influenced by so many things other than diet. But since a sciencey sounding blood test said that you might be sensitive to gluten, eggs, dairy, wheat, yeast, soy, asparagus, and carrots, then I'm worried that you would fear these foods for the rest of your life. This would lead to an unnecessarily restrictive diet that is difficult to manage, is socially isolating, eliminates nutrient-dense foods, and could potentially send you down the path of orthorexia, an eating disorder characterized by a compulsive obsession of eating a proper or healthful diet. Now, there certainly are conditions where restricting particular foods is necessary, and it can be really frustrating to figure these out. If you suspect any food intolerances, seek out professional, individualized help from dietitians and physicians. My nourishable take? Don't do the Everly Well food sensitivity test. The research doesn't support that it has any diagnostic value, and the test results could send you down a restrictive path that distorts your relationship with food. That's what science tastes like. Hey, one more thing before you go. I filmed this video back in February of 2012, before the COVID-19 pandemic had really taken off in the US. Since mid-March, Everly Well has been helping to supply COVID-19 tests to high-risk patients, seniors, and healthcare workers on the front line. While this doesn't change my analysis of Everly Well's IgG food sensitivity test, I sincerely applaud them for using their resources to help fight this pandemic. Thank you, Everly Well. Thanks for tuning in to Nourishable. Check out my video description for all my references, and share, like, and subscribe to stay up to date on all things nutrition.